So good to see you. Uh, tonight we're going to do a little different. We're we're going to get into the teaching hopefully quickly because I'm not sure how long this is going to take to get to. We've got a lot of material, a lot of content. Thank you for being here. It was so strange missing last Wednesday uh, due to the weather. I'm glad that uh, the ice has moved out, but that we've still got some moisture falling. Amen to that. Uh, so I, I hope that you brought your Bibles with you. I hope you brought something to be able to take notes on. And I would love to hear from you as well. Uh, you know, if if you have any questions afterwards or, or what whatever, I, this is hopefully a two way street and not just uh, you know me uh, teaching at you, but but us looking at the word together. I just really believe that our uh, the world that we're in, our society that we're in, uh, if we do not have more people turn their hearts fully to Christ, we are just in a mess. And I believe that's our job as the church to be at the forefront of that. Uh, we can't be passive about it. And uh, we're going to be talking tonight uh, about this teaching series called Faith That Works. Uh, specifically tonight, our, our lesson title is Faith in Your Faith. Uh, and I'll kind of expound on that and explain on that uh, a little bit. But could we first just open up with prayer? And uh, since there's a smaller group of us, I, I think it would be appropriate to if you've got a prayer request, we could make it known. Uh, could I ask you to keep praying for Miss Willie Blagg? Uh, she did get moved uh, to Health South. Is that correct, Carol? You just told me that to, uh, this afternoon. I'm, I'm glad to hear that, uh, that she was moved from the hospital. That's a good sign, I believe. I did get to see her the other day, and she was alert, uh, knew who I was. Uh, she's got a brain bleed that thankfully has moved from what was going to require surgery, and they believe her body can just repair itself and absorb that. And uh, so keep her lifted up in prayer. And also please pray for uh, Sam, for Samantha Talbert. She's got a, a procedure tomorrow. That's why she's not here tonight. And uh, just we're believing for a good report. I, I don't think all doctor's reports have to be bad. They can come back and tell us we're healthy, that, that we're good, and we're just hoping for a good word from there. Uh, does anybody else have a, a need you'd like us to agree with you in prayer about tonight? Oh, yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Grandchildren and Crystal. Yes, ma'am. Well, could we stand together then and let's open up tonight just going before the Lord in prayer and then we'll get right into the word. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your constant care and provision for us. God, you are so good. You watch out for us even when we're unaware. And so, Lord, as we lift our needs up to you, I know that you hear us. I know that you're mindful of us and that you're working all things out on our behalf. God, I pray that you bless our time tonight. Let it be productive. Let it teach us things that we can uh, put into our everyday life that draw us closer to you, that change this world for you. And Father, we just lift up corporately the needs represented tonight. As Sister Maria said, for her grandchildren and for Crystal. Lord, we lay them at your feet and pray for you to draw them and just provide and bless them. Father, for, for Miss Willie, Black God, right where she's at, Lord, we just pray for your spirit, your touch to be with her. Thank you for keeping her this far on this journey that she's been on. And Lord, we just pray for you to give her full strength and recovery through the blood of Jesus Christ. We just pray for healing in her physical body. Then God, for Sam, as she goes tomorrow for her procedure, Lord, we lift her up to you in, in prayer. And, and we just we pray for peace through this entire thing for her, that, that you just guard her mind and her emotions. Let her trust in you. And God, then we, we trust you to do what only you can do. And we pray for good things, for a good report, a clean bill of health. And God, whatever the outcome, we know that you're in charge. So we, we give this to you by faith. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And all God's people said, amen. You guys can be seated. Thanks again for just being always willing to pray, being willing to uh, come together. Uh, this is going to be a little bit different for me uh, because I, I'm going to be diving into some topics that are very personal. Uh, some of it involves, you know, a lot of uh, just, I guess, uh, self-questioning. Uh, uh, maybe you're not like me, but I was one of those kids that always asked my parents uh, why. Uh, the, the more, and I'm, I'm getting paid back for that. Every one of my kids is that way. And they always want to know not just, you know, uh, what do we have to do, but why do we have to do it? Anybody that way a little bit? You, you like to know, you know, 
not only what we believe, but why we believe it. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I believe that we should desire to know about God, and I don't think our Heavenly Father minds that one bit. Uh, as we talk about this this uh, series called Faith That Works, we're, we're going to look at uh, hopefully seeing some things change in our personal uh, relationship with God. I, I believe that no matter how long you've been a believer in Jesus, you constantly need to be growing in your faith. You consistently need to be progressing and pursuing your relationship with God. Uh, if, if you are married, if you've got a spouse, there's never a moment where you need to stop pursuing that spouse, where you need to stop investing in that relationship. If, if that happens, uh, it never ends well. I, I end up counseling people, and usually that's a, a factor as marriages start to fall apart. It's that communication has ceased. They're drifting apart. They're not making effort uh, toward one another, and that'll happen uh, spiritually as well in our relationship with God. And so let's never get complacent. Uh, I believe, hopefully as we're talking about these things these next uh, several weeks, hopefully this will stir up some questions in you. And again, I don't want this to be just a one-way street. If you have questions, if you have you know, input. Uh, we'll try to leave time at the end of each night, and and also, uh, just you can come to me personally, or we can talk about it in other settings as well. Uh, but I encourage you to to bring your word every week, bring bring scripture with you, and bring something to write with to write on, because there's going to be a lot of stuff that you're going to want to retain, and a lot of things that if you don't write it down, uh, sometimes you won't take it with you. But let's talk about this phrase, uh, not just faith that works, but specifically tonight, faith in your faith, uh, because this is a, a struggle for a lot of us, is that we believe in God, we believe that God is all-powerful, we believe that God is, you know, omniscient, omnipresent, omni-everything, but we have trouble believing that we are deserving of Him. Anybody relate to that? We, we have difficulty believing that we can partake in, in all the things of God. Uh, in, in fact, I think one of the things we struggle with the most is having faith in our faith. Uh, that almost feels uh, arrogant. That almost feels boastful to talk about like our faith does something. And there's so much division in the church. There's so much uh, differing opinions about uh, how much of a part we play in spiritual things, uh, like in our salvation We've talked about it a little bit. I'm not going to go into detail, but uh, you've probably heard some people who subscribe to uh, what's called the golden thread theory or, uh, you know, just the uh, predestination. You may have heard that term where they believe that you are saved before you were ever even born, uh, that, that that golden thread goes, you know, from eternity to eternity. And really, we don't play any integral role. It, it's all completely God. You probably remember us talking about that. Uh, you may have heard people that believe that way. You may believe that way. I'm, I'm not here to try to tear down your belief. I'm trying to point us to Scripture, though, on how things deal with faith. I want to encourage and challenge you this way. When it comes to discussing faith, when it comes to discussing spiritual matters, it's always best however possible, to leave opinions at the door. Can I get an amen on that? It's always best to let Scripture speak and not preference. And that, that's really hard. That's hard to do. We've all got preconceived ideas. Uh, we've all got stuff that we were grown, you know, we were raised to believe. And so I, I really hope that you can start with a clean slate and we can... Uh, look at Scripture together. I want to ask you, if you've got your Bible, and please bring it. If you don't have it tonight, bring it in the upcoming weeks. You're going to want it. Turn to Luke chapter 18, the book of Luke chapter 18, as we talk about having faith in our faith. Because I really believe this. Some people, uh, their faith doesn't work right. Um, and that's not by anything that God has done or that God has ordained. Uh, people feel like, well, there's something wrong with me. Uh, no, you're a creation of God. It's just I don't think a lot of times people believe what God says. They don't believe in what they're capable of or what God is capable of doing through them. There's some important principles in this parable here. Uh, Luke 18, verses 1 through 8, talks about the parable of the persistent widow. And, you know, a parable is a story. This is a metaphor that Christ is uh, showing to teach a heavenly truth. He 
gives us an earthly example. If you look with me at verse 1, it says, Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. I hope you might underline, however that, that reads, whatever translation, how it says that we should pray and not give up or not cease. He said, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will God not bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Now, this talks about prayer, and it talks about faith. Two things that are very uh, much uh, hand in hand. They, they coincide in a lot of ways. Because what is it we do when we pray? We are talking to God by faith, right? Is that fair enough? Uh, when you pray, I, I don't think it's like email. Does anybody even email anymore? I don't know. Uh, where you send and then you get a reply. It's not uh, like a phone conversation where you hear audibly from the Lord. But how many of you believe when you pray, God hears you? I, I mean, that, that is scriptural. We, we say these things. But again, having faith in our faith, we sometimes really struggle believing what we say we believe. And this example here in scripture is so good. There's this uh, judge of the land, this ruler of this land that, it says he doesn't fear God or care what people think. I think his name is Obama. I'm just sorry. I shouldn't have said that. That was the Holy Spirit. I'm sorry. That wasn't me. But uh, all jokes aside, here's this guy that he is not godly. Uh, he's not even necessarily moral. He's just going to do whatever he wants to do. You know anybody like that. Uh, and it says that this person is uh, pestered, uh, for lack of a better word, by a widow who needs justice. She says, grant me justice against my adversary. She keeps coming back to him time and time again saying, grant me justice. Now, again, this is not a good judge. This is not a moral judge. He doesn't care what God or people thinks. But because it keeps wearing on him, because it keeps frustrating him, he finally says that I'll see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. So she'll leave me alone. Now, I say this to tell you, some of these things we're going to talk about are spiritual. Some of them are practical or what I would also call mechanical. Uh, how many of you know that there are certain laws that God has put in place, spiritual and physical? We have physical laws like gravity, uh, time, th things that we can, you know, uh, even observe in the scientific realm. And then there are spiritual laws, too, that are put in place. And I'll tell you, something that we need to be very aware of but also very uh, respectful of is that when we ask God for something, we'd better be ready for him to answer it. Be careful what you ask for because there are certain mechanics in place that sometimes we get things that we think we wanted but we really didn't need. And uh, God is, is always going to be consistent when he makes a promise in his word, when he makes a promise uh, through his spirit, what he has inspired, he will keep his promise whether we like it or not. He is not a man that he should lie. And so, again, this is just something to be respectful of. When we talk about this faith, faith is a very powerful thing. Uh, society is, is caught up right now with certain types of weapons, certain guns, what should people be allowed to buy and not buy. And I don't want to get into a political discussion. I think you, you can be around me for about five minutes and tell what I feel anyway. But uh, I'm just saying that that's really not even the point tonight. But we even realize as people there's certain things that we have to be, uh, you know, we have to make a decision on certain things that people may or may not should have access to. There are certain things that certain types of people may or may not should have access to. And some of the things we're going to teach, some of the things we're going to learn, they are practical in nature, they are mechanical in nature, and the enemy tries to utilize that same power 
uh, Satan, his, his forces, try to utilize his same power. So we as the church, we need to understand it. We need to reverence it. We need to utilize it, but do it in the right way. So this woman, again, has come to this judge, and because she keeps pestering, because she keeps, you know, just bothering him with this problem that she has, even he says, he, uh, you know, all right, I'll give you what you're asking for. And Jesus tells us in those last couple of verses, he said, listen what the unjust says in verse 6. And will God not bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? Listen what Jesus says. I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. Does anyone believe God is, is always truthful? God's word is always true. Can I tell you, I don't care how bad of a mess our world seems to be or America seems to be. It seems like we're, we're torn down political lines and moral lines and, and spiritual lines, all that. Can I tell you, God in an instant with a snap of his fingers can change everything. He is that powerful. He is that much in charge. But we have to be ready to receive from him. We have to be ready to receive what we ask for and believe what we pray for. Here's, I guess, the main point. I'm going to tell you the main point up front tonight of what I hope you remember tonight, and then hopefully we'll build on it. The main point that I want you to remember is that God is who gets things done. And, and I've got this for you on the screen so you can write it down. God is who gets things done, but faith is what gives things to God. Think on that for just a moment. God is who, it, It's all because of God. That's where these people, they think sometimes everything is predestined because, yes, it is only by the grace of God that anything good ever happens. We don't deserve it. We didn't earn it. I totally understand that. But we have a certain responsibility, uh, an opportunity, if you will, because of God. He's the one that gave it to us to exercise our faith, and it's by faith that we give things to the one who can change things. Does that make sense? A lot of people struggle with this because uh, they, they want to know, well, what part do I need to do? What part does God need to do? God has to do everything, but we have to be willing to let him do everything. That's what faith really looks like. And that, that it, this is a struggle for a lot of us. This is a struggle for me, and it's something that, that, that the Holy Spirit is constantly working on in my life that, uh, that through the, the process of sanctification, of submitting to Scripture, of trying to take every thought captive as the Bible instructs that, that God is helping me work through. And so this leads to just a couple of questions that I want to address tonight. And then if you've got any questions as well about faith uh, tonight, I, I want to take some time to uh, do our best to address those. Question one is, what are we allowed to believe for? Um, I get asked this in different uh, examples. People will say it in different ways. But this is a, it's one of the most common questions I've been asked in ministry when it comes to prayer. Is, what am I allowed to pray for? Because we saw those two kind of go hand in hand. That, that woman uh, it was talking about her just, uh, if you will, praying to this man, just speaking to this judge, this unjust judge, and then Jesus saying, if you ask anything of God, he will get you justice quickly, but will I find faith when I come back on the earth? You, you show your faith through your prayer to God. You show your belief in God by speaking to him. And so a lot of people wonder, what are we allowed to believe for? Are there certain things that are off limits? You know, there's so much ickiness uh, sometimes in, uh, you know, the televangelist world. There's a lot of good. Don't get me wrong. I, I hate that the good ones get associated with the crazy ones. But th there were things decades ago where people were selling, like, holy water uh, that, you know, you, you had to pay a certain amount to get a blessing. Uh, they, they were commercializing Christianity. It was disgusting. And I, fortunately, I think there's less of that now than there used to be. But that, that left a bad taste in a lot of people's mouth. Uh, that, that's how some people think of the church, unfortunately. And they were like, well, you know, all these people are believing for yachts and private airplanes and yada, yada, yada. So that's a legitimate question. What are you allowed to believe for? And I want you to ask yourself that question, like personally, because I can't decide that for you, really. I mean, I can tell you what the Bible says and pray the Holy Spirit works on your heart. But can I tell you, you will never receive more than you believe. That, that's a, a biblical truth. It's a scriptural principle. God's not going to force things on us. He's just not. And so 
this is a phrase I hope you might remember. When you pray, if you don't expect it to happen, then don't expect it to happen. That, that's, just, that's just truth. You'll have things in your life, and I'll tell you, if you don't expect, we sometimes, uh, you know, when I was a kid, this may be a weird example, but when I was a kid, I, all, all the, the boys in school, we reached a certain age, we started to take notice of the girls. Y'all know what I'm talking about? My son's nine. He's starting to notice in the last couple of years, he's really, you know, I notice when he stands around a girl, all of a sudden he's jabbering 90 miles a minute, trying to impress them, doing all these things. He, he's starting to, to take a shine to, to the ladies, and, and, you know, that's just normal. When we first started, you know, liking girls as a kid, we had this thing, uh, you know, I don't know what kids do nowadays with their cell phones, but we had this high-tech system where you guarded yourself from putting your emotions too far out there, but you could get a response from somebody. Anybody remember the super effective system of circle your answer, do you like me, yes or no? That, that has deep spiritual roots, I think. <laughs> I'm just making that up. But seriously, we would do that, and the reason I, I would would do that, I, I did that a time or two. I'd pass a note to a girl, do you like me, circle yes or no. I was afraid to put myself too far out there. I didn't want to have them look me in the face if they didn't like me and say no. I didn't want that rejection. And I'll tell you, we kind of do this with God. It's like, God, will you answer my prayer, circle yes or no? And we, we shove the note across the, the desk, and we're like bracing, expecting. Who do we think we're talking to when we talk to our Heavenly Father. Y'all, can I tell you, the Lord is on your side. Somebody just may need to hear that. He's not, he's not wanting you to fail. He has not set your life up as some series of, of mis, you know, mis, unfortunate events. And he, he's not just you know, getting some kind of uh, sick joy out of watching people suffer. God sent his only son to suffer in our place. That's how much he loves us. He doesn't want to see you go through hard times. He wants to help you get through hard times. He wants you to be victorious. He is your heavenly father. And so we need to get past that mindset of like expecting failure when we put our faith out there. Again, we need to have faith in our faith. God would not ask us to believe things through faith if there wasn't a good reason, if there wasn't a great reward. Faith in your faith. And so what are you allowed to believe? John chapter 14 and I encourage you to read this whole chapter. John 14 is a great chapter, but look with me, if you will, just at verses 13 and 14 uh, tonight. Jesus speaks here. Again, I'm not going to opinion. I'm going to the Son of God the, the, straight from his mouth. He says, and I will do whatever you ask in my name. You know this verse. And why? So that the Father may be glorified in the Son you may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Now, church, this is huge. Because, again, what are we allowed to believe for? What are we allowed to ask for? Jesus just laid it out very plainly. He said, whatever you ask in his name, he will do. So that means even the things that we are not capable of doing. Again, have faith in your faith, not in yourself. H have your faith in your belief in God that even the things that you don't physically or spiritually or emotionally have the capacity to accomplish, Jesus Christ will do for you when you ask them in his name. Now, I think a great way to relate this to, to us, if I can try to make a parable or a metaphor that makes sense to my brain and, and speaks to my spirit, is it's almost like we have God's credit card to be able to use and, and spend. And now, if you've ever had your parents loan you money or, or use a credit card or something like that, uh, I would hope that you'd have the respect for them and the honor for them and maybe a little bit of the fear of them. Look, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, the Bible says. That if God lent you his credit card, you wouldn't just go out and buy a bunch of you know, ridiculous stuff, uh, especially not damaging stuff to yourself you wouldn't go out and buy drugs and porn and things that are harmful spiritually so why would you ever ask for those things you don't want that showing up on God's credit card statement amen you wouldn't be going out and just buying things selfishly either you want to make him proud you want him to, to know that hey you're, you're doing good things but can I tell you what 
God doesn't mind us doing is using his resources to invest in his kingdom. Your life matters for a lot of other people. Did you know that? That there are people that you're going to cross paths with or that God wants you to pray for, or speak to, make an impact on. That he wants to make an investment in you. So when you're praying for your peace of mind, when you're praying for your healing, don't just think of it as selfish. You are a vessel. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says. So stop feeling like that's being selfish. You're just glorifying God. Like, like Jesus said in this scripture, he d- said in verse 13, I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. This is all for God's glory. So what are we allowed to believe for? Whatever gives God glory. And can I tell you, that's a way bigger scope of things than we think. Uh, Yes, it is okay to to believe for your healing. Yes, it is okay to believe for your children, your grandchildren, their great-great-grandchildren to be saved. Can I tell you, God wants to bless you. He wants to get rid of generational curses and replace them with generational blessings. That's all throughout the Bible. You would see him reset entire cultures to be grafted into to his kingdom, into his family. So, church, we need to learn that we, we don't have to just pray for small things. God is mindful of our small things, and I'm thankful. But, y'all, he is a God capable of doing all things, not just small things. Amen. So when we pray, when we believe, again, have faith in your faith. I'm, I'm going to say that phrase so hopefully it just, I don't want you to get sick of it, but I want it to get ingrained in you. That God has given you this faith for a reason. And so many people, we don't use it because we're afraid of rejection or we're afraid of failure. That's not believing in your faith. You don't think your faith really does anything. You think that, you know, what you believe is never going to happen, which leads to the next question. So what are we allowed to believe for? Well, if we can believe for all things in the name of Jesus, if we can believe that he will do whatever we ask in his name, and we can ask anything in his name, and he will do it. That's, that's scripture, and there's tons of scripture that said this. Then how much faith does it take? Here's where we start getting to the practical. Because people all, always want to know. That I've had people literally, maybe you've wondered this, they ask me, how often do I need to go to church to be saved? You know, just, I, I, that's a genuine question, especially new converts. People are like, well, how many, you know, how many prayers do I need to pray? How many hours a day do I need to pray? You ever wondered, or is there some formula? A lot of people genuinely uh, want to ask those questions, but it's almost like the emperor's new clothes. We don't want to admit that we don't know, or we don't want to admit that something's wrong, and so we just pretend like we're okay. Uh, y'all, this is a genuine question. How much faith does it take to see prayers answered? If, if you've got prayers, if you've got things that you have lifted up to God that you have not seen answered, if you've got Uh, situations in your life, strongholds in your life or in your family that you need God to take care of and you're like, something is wrong. Can I tell you, God never loses. God never fails. So if something's failing, we need to examine ourselves. We need to look at ourselves and self-examine. There are things that God, again, has put in ordinances, laws, spiritual laws. He's put in place that we must honor, that we must abide by. Now, Christ answers this question for his disciples many times, uh, but two times that I think are, are so uh, useful for tonight just to kind of get the ball rolling on, on, this, on answering this, because this is a big question, how much faith does it take? Um, a lot of people say, well, I just don't seem to have the faith to see someone get healed when I lay hands on them and pray for them. A, lo- a lot of people, I, I don't think very many here tonight, but a lot of people wouldn't even be comfortable. Let's just be honest. I wouldn't even be com- they would say, I wouldn't even be comfortable laying hands on somebody and praying for them to be healed. I wouldn't even know if that's supposed to work or, or if I'm supposed to be the one to do that. I don't know if I've got the gift of healing. Or I don't know. Can I tell you, no one person has the gift of healing. That, that's bad theology. That's bad Bible. The, all those gifts come from God. They come from the Holy Spirit. And if you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, you have access to all the gifts. Did you know that's what the Bible says? We like to pigeonhole things, and you know that's where society produces Benny Hens. And I'm not knocking Benny Hen per se, but there's a lot of people. They think I, I, I knew a, a lady who uh, actually spoke to my father in Paris. There was a Benny Hen crusade coming somewhere in Oklahoma. Paris is kind of like here, Paris, Texas, close to the border. And there, there was a Benny Hen crusade. She came to my dad. Didn't even go to our church, but wanted to know if our church was going to this Benny Hen crusade because she said, "I know if I can get to him, I can get healed." 
You know what my dad told her? He said, well, if you'd like, we, are, we did end up going to that crusade, but he said, you can ride with us to the Benny Hinn crusade, but if you'd like, Jesus can heal you right now today. And y'all, I watched a group of people. He called for the elders of the church. They prayed for this lady, and she ended up taking a bunch of her friends to the Benny Hinn crusade because she was telling them about what Jesus had already done in her life. I watched her get miraculously healed. She had terrible arthritis and actually had uh, in her spine some of her vertebrae. There were fractures that there was documented evidence of her being healed. And can I tell you, th- this is no diss to Benny Hinn. Sorry, he's an easy target sometimes. People make YouTube videos about him. Don't go look those up. But... You know, the poor guy, I think he really is sincere. I've, I've heard him preach in person. I think he is genuine as the day is long. Uh, you know, but there's some people that feel like they've got to get to him. Y'all, that's not his desire. He'll sit there and tell you, you don't have to have me touch you. You don't have to have me blow on you. It's just, uh, he'll, he'll say, it's just God. It's just Jesus. How many of you really believe that? Th- then why do we have these notions? Uh, you know, in the church world, we have we have created some uh, golden calves, if you would. That's what the Israelites, they made. When God wasn't, you know, doing what they felt like he should do, Moses was on the mountaintop getting the Ten Commandments and uh, was speaking to the Lord. They went to their own devices and created a golden calf. They made something sacred out of something that should not have been sacred. They were worshiping the wrong thing. We, we make golden calves. Even in the church world, uh, there are people... Y'all, I was saved in an altar call. I believe in calling people to come and pray. I believe in the drawing of the Spirit that happens when we're gathered together corporately. But y'all, can I tell you, there's a lot of people that are going to die and go to hell between Monday and, and Sunday. That we, we need to be ready and willing to pray with somebody, to reach out to somebody, to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ wherever we're at. Because there's a whole lot of spiritual warfare that doesn't neatly fall within 11 o'clock and 12 o'clock on Sunday or 7 and 8 on Wednesday or whatever. The devil is active, and so must the body of Christ to be active, to fight the good fight of faith. And so Jesus talked about this question. He responded to his disciples. In in Matthew 17, he was responding to his disciples because they were praying for someone to have demons cast out of them, and it didn't work. It didn't happen. And they said, "Why, why doesn't this happen? And he replied, Matthew 17, 20, he replied, because you have so little faith. Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Listen to this next part. Nothing will be impossible for you. Those are the words of Christ. Nothing will be impossible. We know with God all things are possible, right? We can shout with that one. I, I, I believe that fervently. How many of you believe that deep down in your soul? With God, everything is possible. Then if you have God, if you are the body of Christ, if you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, did you know that because of God in you, again, it's not us, God is the one who gets things done, but faith is what gives things to God. With God in you and God through you, all things are possible for you to him who believes. That's the Bible. Faith that works has got to get that ingrained. You've got to get that in your spirit. And it's sometimes different than what we expect or different than what we uh, think it's going to look like. Jesus says a similar thing in Luke 17. I think it's interesting. It's Matthew 17 and Luke 17 about faith as small as a mustard seed. In Luke 17, verses 5 and 6, it says, The apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. How many of us feel that way to God? Please increase my faith, Lord. He replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Now, there's a fascinating thing. God's word is is amazing. If you'll actually take time to study it and, and look at it and let the Holy Spirit, you know, help you. Uh, it's got incredible depth to it. and I Maybe y'all are, are more agricultural than I am. I didn't know a lot about mulberry trees or uh, you know what, what this tree was called. And I, I researched it, and I, I'd heard people teach on it a little bit, but I wanted to look at it myself. And I found out they have an incredibly intricate root system. It almost balls up on itself. Its roots get in so deep and, and kind of intertwine, making it just very difficult, almost impossible 
to pull out by its roots. It, it's Now, the disciples, it was a very common uh, tree in that area. The disciples, this would have made sense to people in that day and age. You know, if you talk to us about mesquite trees, we know what you're talking about, right? I understand mesquite trees are the devil. When you try to get those out of the ground, they're all pokey. Their roots seem to go to China. And, you know, th- that's, that's kind of the mulberry tree was that way to their culture. They knew it was deeply rooted. And so he said, say to this mulberry tree, I think it's very important to notice everything God says has a purpose. He says, be uprooted. Not just going to chop it down, right? Be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Can I tell you, I think there's a reason for this. I love when Jesus says, say to the mountain, move from here to there. You just need that mountain to get out of your way. But what about when you've got something deeply ingrained in you, a stronghold, a, a deep hurt, a difficult, difficult battle spiritually? Can I tell you, not everything just happens instantly when we're talking about spiritual things. Uh, sometimes it takes the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous person to avail. And w- when it talks about this mulberry tree and that deep root system, you probably have something in your life, in your mind, that it is very difficult for you to believe God for. It is very difficult for you to uh, give to the Lord and, and by faith trust Him to take care of. And some of the reason may be that you've prayed for it once and nothing seemed to happen. Can I tell you, this mulberry tree, if it's going to be uprooted, that root system has to be dealt with first and it has to be untangled, it has to be pulled. And I believe the disciples would have understood by this wording, and we should understand too, that sometimes there is a process to things. But if we hold on by faith, it doesn't matter how long it takes to get done, it's going to get done. And there are things in your life, in your heart that may be deep-rooted. There may be battles and situations you feel like you've been fighting forever. Can I tell you just what Scripture had said, uh, you know, in in the very first verse we read in Luke 18.1, Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and what? Not give up. That's when your faith is really revealed. Is that I will pray, and if nothing changes, I will pray again. And if nothing changes, just like that woman that kept coming back to the unjust judge, she said, grant me justice against my adversary. How many of you need some justice against the enemy of your soul? On behalf of your family, there are things that the devil has done that he needs to pay for and that you need help to get through. Can I tell you, don't give up on praying for those things. Don't give up on calling out to God. You are completely within your rights as a child of God to ask for those things in the name of Jesus. You are completely in your rights not only to ask for those things, to expect those things. Because again, if you don't expect anything to happen, don't expect anything to happen. But I'd say if you hold on to those things, even mountains, those things that seem so daunting, those things that seem you know, insurmountable, they have to get out of your way. The Bible says when we resist the devil, he has to flee. But even those things you can't see, that root system's dug in. Those, those, you're like, I don't understand why this problem doesn't seem to be going away. I don't understand why nothing seems to be changing. Can I tell you, that may be God is un, undoing those roots. He's trying to pull loose things that have been deep-rooted, that have been entangled, ensnared. And I tell you, what the mulberry tree will do also, it tries to entangle those roots with other plants and other roots. It wants to bring them with it as it comes out. And God is saying, I'm not going to let the enemy tear down other things when I rip this out of your life. It may be God moving pieces away. He may be changing relationships. He may be changing situations in your family, on your job, in your own heart. Do you know that God sometimes needs to change your character before he changes your situation? Amen. And so to recognize faith that's working, you need to understand faith is just that. It's believing in that that you might not see. And this root system, you wouldn't notice for a while, but eventually it says, you can say that, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. You need to take that kind of stance when you pray. Have that kind of faith. Because really, if we could pray to God for something that we desperately need, for ourselves or someone else, just think honestly with me for a moment. If you have a desperate need in your heart, or, or for someone else, or that you're praying for this world, if all it takes for you to give up 
faith on that? Is it not happening instantly? That's not very strong faith. I mean, if the devil can keep you distracted for just a few moments and you're done, you know, what do we think this is? This is a spiritual war we're in. And I want you to understand this. I, d don't misunderstand what I'm about to say, but the final point I want you to remember tonight is that, yes, it's faith that gives things to God, but understand that even the enemy operates. He understands these rules of engagement, these rules of faith. The enemy operates by faith, and so must we. we got to do the same thing. Uh, the devil has people believing blindly the wrong thing. People, the way that you behave, the way that you live your life, it is a reflection of your faith. And so there are so many people that they say they believe in God, but their life says something completely, you know, contradictory. You can say all day, you can say a lot of stuff and not mean it. And the enemy has a lot of people deceived into really believing him. Into believing that, uh, well, just everybody sins, so I've got to sin. Look, that statement's not wrong. Yes, everybody sins. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I get that. But can I tell you, if that's what you expect, that's what you'll do. If you expect the rest of your life to live in the bondage of sin, don't ever expect to get out of bondage. But can I tell you, by the grace of God, by the power of His Holy Spirit, by the transformation of His Word, just, just by His help, by trusting in Him, I've overcome a lot of things in my life. That... Things I wasn't proud of, I'm now proud to say. I'm not bound by those things anymore. That mulberry tree had to let go of me a little bit. Can I get an amen? And you need to walk in that kind of life of saying, no, I don't have to be this way forever. No, I don't have to live in fear forever. You need to just start talking to yourself until you believe it sometimes. You need to pray over your own mind. Can I tell you, God already knows that he's in control. You just need to remind yourself of that. That's where we need to just let him get things done. Faith is what gives things to God so that he can get things done. And the enemy operates by faith. He gets us to believe in the wrong thing. There's counterfeit all throughout scripture of the enemy, of the devil trying to do things. Think of way back in the Old Testament uh, when Moses uh, and Aaron, Aaron threw his rod down in the, the presence of Pharaoh and it became a snake, it became a serpent. And Pharaoh said, oh my magicians, my, you know, my court, they can do that. And they threw their, their rods down. They became snakes too. I think this is similar to when you'll see people who they're living like the devil, but they're living large. You know what I mean by that? You see people, they seem blessed, but you know they're not following God. i got to tell you, one reason is some people understand there's biblical principles. The devil knows this. There's certain laws, there's certain things in place. If you will work hard, nine times out of ten, you're going to be blessed if you put effort into something. And, and the fact of the matter is the Bible also says it rains on the just and the unjust. So it, it just, you can't, you know, don't, don't get tricked into believing in karma. That, well, because life is difficult, I must have done something wrong. People came to Jesus, you know, and would say, well, what, did this, what was this person's sin? Why, why, are, why are they have this disability? What did they do wrong? And, and that's, again, that's our self. That's a lack of faith. That, that's wanting to find some sort of formula instead of believing by faith that God can overcome anything. But the enemy knows how to attack our faith. He knows how to misdirect our faith, how to get us to put it in the wrong things. And sometimes we even just put it too much in ourself. We, we give ourselves too much credit. We think that we, can, that we can weaken God. I can tell you, you're not strong enough to weaken God's love for you. You think, but all I've done, it, it's harmed my relationship with the Lord. He would never want to look at me again. He would never want to have anything to do with me again. That is a lie from the father of lies, from the pits of hell. That is not from heaven. God looks at us knowing everything about us with love. He looks at us having nothing to, to give to him, and he only wants to give us everything. That, that's just how our heavenly father is. And, you know, again, Pharaoh's magicians, they were counterfeiters. I think of Daniel. Uh, when he uh, was interpreting dreams that you know there had been astronomers and mediums and things all throughout scripture uh, King Saul went to a witch to try to get answers instead of going to the Lord Th there's all these things that that happened one of the most interesting I I'd encourage you to maybe just jot down this scripture reference and read it if you 
haven't in a while or if you've never read it, in Numbers chapter 22 through chapters 24, 22 through 24, it's where Balak summons Balaam. Anybody know that story with the talking donkey? Uh, fascinating. That really happened. I mean, that's a, that's a literal, it's not a metaphor, it's not a parable. And there was a man uh, named Balaam who was summoned by, you know, the leader of the, the, the Moab tribe, the Moabites, we call them. Uh, they, they were scared to death of the Israelites coming in and wiping them out. So they wanted this guy to come. He lived uh, near the Euphrates. He, he was not, you know, th- there's been debate on did he believe in God or not. Uh, what they should be asking is did he follow God or not because even the devil believes in God. But this man, he was like a sorcerer. He, he could speak curses over you. Like a, I always think of like a witch doctor. Did anybody ever see those? I was a big Scooby-Doo fan. This is going to have no spiritual significance. But I remember there being a witch doctor in Scooby-Doo where he'd put pins in the little doll. Anybody seen that? And that's what I think of when I think of this guy. He would put curses on people and, like, stick pins in a doll. I know that's not really what he did, but I like to think that way. Spiritual Scooby-Doo, if you will. But this, this man was called on by the leader of the Moabites, he wanted him to put a curse on the Hebrews. He said, I, I need you to curse them so that we can defeat them. You know, they're, they're coming for us, they're gunning for us, and they had already overthrown so many. And so he gets on his way, and he says, you know, I've got to pray about it. I've got to, uh, you know, seek God. And now what's confusing here is the place where this guy lived, if you study historically where he was at, he believed in many gods probably. Everybody there was, they were polytheists, they call them. And so, yes, while he, he might have acknowledged the God of the Israelites, he also had other stuff that he prayed to. He had other things. and uh, you know, he, he, he may have known better than to cross paths or to get crossways with God, but he said, you know, I can only do what, what God has said. He starts to go and, uh, you know, he meets with this, this leader, and the, the king says, you know, I'll give you whatever you want. You know, just take care of the Israelites. Put a curse on them. And he tells him, I can't do anything except what God allows. But, again, I want you to see here, there are people in this world that have certain power afforded them by the enemy. Now, this may sound a little kooky, this may sound a little weird, but can I tell you, I believe there is leadership in government, both here in the states and globally, that is being influenced and infiltrated by the enemy of our soul. I think you'd be blind not to see that. And they have certain warfare, they have certain tactics and by faith, they, they do certain things. They have certain power here. Ephesians six twelve reminds us that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Uh, so, like with Balaam and Balak, the Moabites, they wanted to go get somebody to fight against the people of God. Church, we need to recognize that the enemy, he understands faith, and he's trying to pull people to believe in him, and he is constantly operating through that faith that people have in him. We have got to fight what we call the good fight of faith. There is a battle going on, whether we want to be mindful of it or not, for people's souls. Uh, it is bigger than any political party or even a global thing. I mean, you can, again, just look at prophecy, look at world events. We are ripe for the Antichrist to sweep in, and we wouldn't even recognize him. You know, that's what the Bible says, is most people won't even realize it's happened until it's too late. And, y'all, we are right there. Th- think of how many people, if somebody came in saying, I can solve the economy, I can solve, you know, the the rumors of wars, and I, this this war crisis we came in, people would just fall on their face in worship of that person. They would hand over the keys to the UN, to the United States, to whatever. The, the world is ripe for that. And why I say that is so many people have their faith in the wrong thing. I see people that are battling again over this gun issue. Can I tell you, wherever you fall on that issue, whether you think you're right or wrong or I think you're right or wrong, uh, it, it doesn't really matter don't put your faith in people. I, I'm thankful for those who really serve in our government, those that are actual you know, followers of Christ and try to do the right thing. I pray for our government. I do all the time. They need it. You think they're not under attack. But I'll tell you, my hope is not in people. My hope is in what God can do through those people. But I, I'm not, you know, uh, 
I'm not the type to write my congressman all the time. Or I have written letters before because I th- think certain things are our civic duty and we need to go through the right protocols. Paul did that with the Roman Empire. You know, he, he went through certain protocols as a Roman citizen. There's nothing wrong with that. But y'all, ultimately, all the letters we write are not going to do as much good as the prayers that we lift up to heaven, to the courts that are above, even the Supreme Court. And so understand our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Your faith needs to be strong. It needs to be stronger than even, uh, you know, I don't care how strong your bank account is in preparation for an economic collapse. If the, if the dollar falls out, it don't matter how many dollars you have. If the dollar's worth zero, all your dollars will be worth zero. If you're worried about, you know, compartmentalizing or, or compiling a bunch of ammo, a bunch of weapons, can I tell you, if somebody launches a nuclear bomb, I don't care how many guns I've got in my house, if a nuke hits outside, what am I going to do, shoot it? You know, at the end of the day, we've got to have faith in something bigger and greater than all of that. And I tell you, our Heavenly Father, again, with a snap of His fingers, can change any of those situations. He can blast a nuke out of the sky. He can, c- can help us. He can protect us. So I'm not going to worry about all those little people problems. I want to focus my faith where it needs to be, on the Heavenly Father. And a lot of people are weak in their faith. Again, I'm going to say a few things, I guess for the sake of you to just kind of examine your heart, examine yourself. Because the Bible says that these signs, these things will follow those who believe. That was what Scripture said. That's what Jesus tells us. He says that they will lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. He said they will cast out demons. He said that they will speak in, in other tongues. All, all these things, they will drink you know, any deadly thing and it will not harm them. If any of that stuff just seems completely foreign to you, I mean, be real with yourself. If that just seems impossible, if that seems you know, uh, like I could never believe that or that's never going to happen to me, that's not important. Jesus said these are the things that will follow. These are the signs that will follow those who believe in him. We need faith that works. Can I tell you why so many people are falling out of church? It's because they're going to churches that don't really believe in God. Or at least they don't act like it. They believe in protocol. They believe in social you know, gatherings or whatever. But as the Bible described it, they give the appearance of faith or the appearance of God, but they deny the power thereof. Y'all, we can't be that way. We have to be better than that. We got to be more real than that. And I, I submit to you this, this is kind of a segue into next week, and I'm, I'm closing here, and I, I wanted to leave some time for prayer and just to allow the, the Lord to speak to your heart. But you know in James 2, it tells us that faith without works is dead. That's, that's a big, that's kind of our theme chapter, if you will, for this teaching, faith that works. Yes, faith without works is dead, but something I want you to remember, and I, I didn't put it on the screen, but you may want to write it down. Can I tell you, faith without works is dead, but faith with worry is also dead. It's also no good. And that's something that we need to uh, understand. I don't care what's going on in the world. My fight's not with people. My fight's not with the problems of this earth. We're fighting not against flesh and blood, but against darkness, rulers of darkness and authorities, powers of this dark world, spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. That's who we're battling. And so let's let's build up our faith because I guarantee you, we say it all the time, we know that no weapon formed against us can can prosper spiritually. We know that. You've heard that scripture so much, you can recite it. So why do we worry when physical problems arise in our life? Why do we worry when people problems? They're just people. We're not even fighting against them. Can I tell you? I, the Lord's had to check my spirit on this. When somebody says or does something harmful to you, they say something, you know, they gossip about you, they lie about you, they, they say something hurtful to you to try to tear you down. Can I tell you, that's really not just that person. That's the enemy. The Bible says the devil is the accuser of the brethren. We got a, a letter to the church. Y'all may have seen me post about it because I was being a little bit facetious, and I think who wrote it is on my Facebook friends list, actually. That's why I posted about it on Facebook. If they're watching this video, uh, hello. But they, they, uh, they wrote this letter, and it was, it was not even true. It was, it was very untrue, actually. Uh, and it was just accusing. It was belittling. Uh, it, it was hurtful. 
And I got I got a little bit ticked. Is that okay? To t- I'm trying to be sanctified, but I still get ticked sometimes. I got a little angry. This preacher friend of mine, I was telling some of y'all this before service. If he's watching this, thanks a lot, Brandon. Uh, Brandon Bohan, and he pastors in Fort Worth. He, he responded to my Facebook thing, and he started saying on there that he was praying for that person that wrote the letter. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> I wanted to be mad at that person, but he was exactly right. As he said, he's like, I pray because they must be hurting to speak out of that kind of a place. And, you know, what, what has the enemy got their mind twisted in? And what, what, what fear are they in that, they're, that they would even take the time to do something like that? It was such a fruitless exercise anyway. We need to recognize that. The battles you're fighting, they're not against people, not against flesh and blood, but against the enemy. So if you want to see faith that works, have faith in your faith. It's stronger than you realize. You can fight the enemy head on with God's help. And again, we're going to, these next few weeks, we're going to delve into some heavy stuff. I mean, the demonic realm is very real. We can't ignore it. Uh, and we can't just be passive about it. Don't, don't let the devil in your mind. Don't let him in your house. So we need to be aware of the enemy's tactics. As the Bible says, be as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. And you know who's a serpent in Scripture. We need to, we need to know what the devil's thinking like and what his attacks are like. So we're going to look at those things. But understand, what God has given us by faith, what we have access to by faith, is stronger and greater. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Would you stand with me, please, tonight, church? And I want to ask you to do something. If you'll just bow your heads, bow your hearts for just a moment. I'm not going to belabor this point. And I'm sorry I went longer than I intended. If you've got questions, uh, just out of respect for everybody, I know people have to work tomorrow and kids have school. Uh, I'll dismiss you, but if you have questions, I'll hang around and, and try to talk to you one-on-one or at least write them down where I can research it and get back to you. But tonight, as, as we just reflect, as we get ready to pray, will you do a couple of things for me? Before you pray, will you recognize first and foremost you are about to speak directly to your Heavenly Father when you pray? You need to believe that out of the gate. You're not just saying words to the ceiling. But it says because of Jesus Christ, we can boldly approach the throne of grace. And so when we pray, can you trust with all of your being that God is listening and hears you? And that's a powerful just step one. But as you pray, the Holy Spirit may have put something or someone on your heart to pray for, to believe for. Can I challenge you to have faith in your faith? It may be someone that you thought, think will never get saved. Some situation that you think can never be restored. Some problem that can never be healed or fixed or, or whatever the, the, the difficulty Can I ask you just to trust God and not your own understanding? Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. He'll direct your paths. That's Bible too. And so as we try to get this faith that works, understand you might face something that's a mountain that you can just command it to get out of your way. You may be facing something like a mulberry tree that's dug in, and there's reasons that God has a process. There's reasons that God has timing. He's trying not to rip other things out as He rips that out. And will you trust his plan, trust his process, but no, just like that woman who kept coming again and again to the unjust judge saying, grant me justice against my adversary, your heavenly father, as Jesus said, he'll bring about justice for his chosen ones, and it says that he'll do it quickly. I I believe God's word when it says things like that. Would you lift up, if you've got a situation like that, would you just so I could be in agreement with you, raise your hand right where you're at. You're saying, God, I need your help for something that feels impossible, improbable, very difficult. Amen. Uh, my hand's up as well, so please agree with me in prayer as well. Let's just lift up our hearts to the Lord before we dismiss tonight. Heavenly Father, God of all, I thank you that you listen to us when we pray. Father, I thank you for the gift of faith. The Bible even says it's by grace we're saved through faith. It's such a powerful force. And that you would entrust it with us is incredible to me. God, I lift up my needs. I lift up my heart to you. I ask for those things that seem impossible. And as Jesus said, whatever we ask in his name, so that you may be glorified through the Son, I ask that you would do these things, that these needs in my life, these needs in my heart, these needs in my family, in my church family, in our community, in our world, Lord, I lift up the, the, the great and the small to you and believe that you're the solution to all of it. So, Father, 
as Christ spoke, he said, we may ask anything in his name and he does it. I believe in the name of Jesus for souls to be saved, families restored, sick bodies healed, and, and those in bondage delivered. I believe for spiritual provision where there's a need for finances or a need for peace of mind, a need for calm to anxiety, a need for an uplifting from depression, whatever the need, God, we look to you and believe in you fully. We believe that our faith is effective because you say it is, and we're trusting in you. And the devil cannot cause us to doubt. He cannot have our joy. He cannot have our promises that you've given us. So, God, we lay all these things at your feet, and we give to you, God, those things that we know you can take care of, you can get done. And we speak these in faith, giving glory to Jesus and glory to our Heavenly Father by the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray and all God's people said in agreement, amen. Somebody give God praise for that gift of faith we had. Hallelujah. God bless you, church. I hope to see you on Sunday. Y'all go with God. And like I said, if you've got any questions, I'm sorry I took a little longer. I won't do that every week, hopefully. Believe that by faith. But if you got questions.